About a year ago, I made a video detailing the history of Joy-Con drift and how it undermines Nintendo's legacy as a company that makes good things. Considering how long it's been, I'd imagine that the situation must have improved by now. Okay, so everything's worse? Nintendo is facing three ongoing class action lawsuits in the United States and one in Canada. A French consumer advocacy group is suing them, alleging that the Joy-Cons were designed with planned obsolescence. And the European Consumer Organization is urging the European Commission to launch an official investigation into the Joy-Con drift issue. But Nintendo did release a brand new Switch model and said that Joy-Con drift is inevitable. The PlayStation 5's DualSense controller started having widespread drifting issues only a few months after its release. And oh look, Sony was also hit with a class action lawsuit over it. A class action lawsuit that was filed against Microsoft over Xbox One controller drift was recently settled out of court. But you know, uh, new Xbox Series X and S controllers are drifting, so. All right, so joystick drift has rapidly gone from a Nintendo issue to an actual modern gaming epidemic. Okay, I'm sure there are a lot of people who were triggered by the word epidemic and are already composing a well thought out and not at all irrationally emotional argument in the comments. Despite the numerous online complaints and forum posts, despite the lawsuits, despite the actual empirical evidence that has come out in the past few years, there are still people to this day who insist that joystick drift is not a real problem. Come here, joystick drift deniers. Come close to my disembodied emotionless head. We need to talk. I'm gonna break down some of the most common arguments I've heard joystick drift deniers preach around the internet and argue my case that yes, joystick drift is not only an epidemic, but also emblematic of a much, much larger problem with how the modern gaming industry operates. Argument. Joystick drift is not widespread enough to be deemed an actual problem. A vocal minority are complaining about a small number of defective controllers that are simply a result of normal failure rates in industrial manufacturing. Obviously, there's a standard rate of hardware failure. Variations in components, factory issues, and a million other things can create a bad product by accident. When you scale electronics manufacturing up to the industrial level that these consoles are at, there are a certain amount of them that are just going to be duds out of the box or shortly after. This is why warranties exist. It's the reason I can take any electronic device I've used reliably for years, look up reviews of it on Amazon, and find 50 one-star word salad manifestos about how this pair of Logitech speakers like is the reason their dad left or something. One of the most common arguments I've heard is that yes, people may be experiencing joystick drift, but it is a result of standard hardware failure rates and not emblematic of a wider problem that needs to be addressed by these companies. All I have to point to is the inordinate amount of complaints, videos, and unhinged tweets that have flooded the internet since the first person counted balls on their Switch. Posts from random internet users not enough for you? How about the fact that the Joy-Con has been the subject of two different consumer advocacy group investigations in Europe, and the multiple class action lawsuits. While it only takes one person to file a class action lawsuit, there is, at least in the United States, a pretty extensive list of requirements that the defense must prove to a judge in order for the case to even make it to court. The various law firms that are representing Switch owners also have pretty extensive histories with successful class action lawsuits over defective products against other billion dollar corporations, meaning they would have an idea of what kind of evidence points towards a systemic problem rather than standard hardware failure. There is tangible evidence in all these lawsuits that point toward a problem that goes beyond the usual faulty issues that electronics are subject to. And yeah, the suit against Microsoft and one of the Joy-Con lawsuits have moved into arbitration, meaning they're skipping the whole judge certifying them for trial thing and in Instead, the cases will be settled out of court by an impartial arbiter. But that has less to do with the judge deeming the suit to be frivolous and is really about a clause in both Nintendo and Microsoft's end user license agreements. The clause prevents users from filing a class action lawsuit unless they 
do something like mail a physical written notice to the company within the first 30 days of purchase to opt out of the agreement. Nintendo's totally calling me out for still not being completely sure how to use this thing. So yeah, it's just the EULAs. The judge's decision to move these cases to arbitration has nothing to do with the merits of either case. In fact, one of the judges even rejected Nintendo's attempt to dismiss the lawsuit outright. To chalk up joystick drift to standard hardware failure is to ignore the mountains of evidence that have been piling up over the years that overwhelmingly points towards the conclusion that this is a problem that goes beyond getting unlucky and purchasing a dud. Argument Joystick drift is inevitable and happens to all controllers. The current issue is not any worse than it has been in past console generations. So yeah, components, given enough time and use, will eventually fail at some point. The potentiometers that all modern controllers implement have a lifespan of reliable use that the manufacturers state plainly. If your controller uses a potentiometer, it will start to drift at some point. But these life cycles should last years with an S. In my case, my gray Joy-Con began drifting a little under a year after I bought my Switch, and my red and blue one started about six months after purchase, and my first DualSense started drifting only a few months after I made that blood sacrifice to Jim Ryan to get my hands on a PS5. Have I had controllers that drifted in the past? Yeah, of course, but only after years and years of heavy use. I've never had controllers drift so consistently and so quickly until this console generation. And I played way more on my older consoles like the GameCube and the Xbox 360 than I ever have or probably ever will on my Switch and PS5. I'm an adult now, people. I gotta do my own laundry and Google how filing taxes works. How hard you push the joysticks and what types of games you play could potentially speed up the degrading process, but no controller, especially one that costs nearly a hundred bucks, should start to drift only a few months after purchasing. I also see the argument that the internet is at fault for making the drifting issue seem like a bigger deal than it actually is. Sure, the visibility of this stuff has probably increased because of the internet, but the thing is, the internet isn't the only metric we have to gauge widespread product defects. Consumers still had the means to disseminate information about this stuff before Reddit. So where are all the stories of widespread drifting issues from back then? Where are the consumer advocacy investigations? Where are the class action lawsuits about drift? Did we as a people make some unconscious collective decision to arbitrarily bring up joystick drift now? It's not like these companies getting into legal hot water about hardware malfunctions wasn't a thing before Joy-Cons. Does that mean that people didn't complain or experience stick drift in the past? No, of course not. But if joystick drift was as bad in past console generations as it has been in the 8th and 9th console generations, we would have seen evidence for it by now. And even if the internet is to blame for this, and joystick drift was as bad in past console generations, that's not a good thing. If anything, then the internet would actually be the good guy here, because it gave consumers the means to organize on a larger level and actually hold these companies' feet to the fire. Argument. Joystick drift is not a manufacturing error. It is a result of people not taking care of their controllers properly. Some people don't take good care of their controllers. Here, look at my GameCube controller that came with the console. This thing looks like it just got back from the fucking battle of Stalingrad. But guess what? This controller doesn't drift. I unquestionably take care of my controllers better in the present than I did as a kid. But I now have five current gen controllers that all started drifting within a year of purchase, which has never happened to me with the what, 10, 15 controllers I've owned for various consoles over the years. All you have to look at is the endless amount of stories of people getting drifting problems regardless of how well they took care of their controllers. But you know what? Let's buy that premise for a second. Okay, so joystick drift is caused by how you take care of your controllers. My Joy-Con started drifting so bad that handheld mode basically became unplayable. So a little over a year ago, I purchased the Hori Split Pad Pro. If the premise that user error is the cause of joystick drift, and both my pair of Joy-Cons started drifting less than a year after I purchased them, then my Hori Pad should be drifting too, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't really have a clever way to say this. It, it doesn't drift. Also, seriously, I highly recommend this controller. Like, regardless of drift, it basically changed the entire experience of handheld mode for me. Hori, hit me up for a sponsorship. My videos sometimes get hundreds of views. Argument. Nintendo is fixing the Joy-Cons for free. What else do you expect them to do? It's true. Nintendo is offering free out of warranty repairs for drifting Joy-Cons, no questions asked, in the Americas, and only after they got sued. Nintendo France began offering free out of warranty repairs in 2020, but it seems whether or not you can get a free repair in the rest of Europe depends on the country you live in. Nintendo of Korea won't do out of warranty repairs for free, and either way you're apparently better off going to a third party electronics store because it'll be cheaper and faster than sending it to Nintendo. Maxsoft, the Switch's distributor in Southeast Asia, doesn't offer free out of warranty repairs. Tencent, who distributes the Switch in China, told a user that an imported game was to blame for their Joy-Con drift. To be fair, those are separate entities from Nintendo proper. In Japan, Nintendo's, you know, home country, they still charge for out of warranty repairs. Ah, but Nintendo Australia will do it for free. So long as you provide proof of purchase, which considering that many people purchased Joy-Cons before it was a known widespread issue, it isn't out of the realm of possibility that you've lost your receipt. But hey, if you don't have a receipt, all you have to do is contact Australia's Consumer Action Law Center, find out that under Australia's consumer protection laws, all owners of a product with a known defect are entitled to a free repair, go back to Nintendo Australia, who claims that they have no obligation to provide free repairs, threaten Nintendo Australia with a formal letter summoning them to the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, have the company claim that they were not the supplier of the Joy-Con and for all they know, the Joy-Con was purchased in another country, and even if it wasn't, the retailer would be the responsible party. Go back to the CALC, who informs you that the Joy-Con serial numbers can be traced back to the country of origin and that under Australia's consumer protection laws, serial numbers count as proof of purchase. Go back to Nintendo Australia with all this proof and BAM! You got a free Joy-Con repair. Oh jeez, I'm gonna pass out. And that's assuming you even live in a country with consumer protection laws that robust. But even if you do have access to free repairs, Nintendo may just replace your Joy-Con with a new one, but only one of the standard colors. Meaning that if you have a special edition Joy-Con, you risk losing it altogether if Nintendo deems they can't repair it. And to cap it all off, some people have had Joy-Con start to drift again after sending them in for repair. Ooh, free Joy-Con repairs. Argument. The drifting issue is super easy to fix yourself, and people are just being lazy by asking Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft to fix it for them. Between the years of radio silence on Nintendo's part and the lack of global free out of warranty repairs, the home repairing of Joy-Con drift has spurred an industry of DIY YouTube videos, articles, and even ready-made repair kits. And yeah, as far as hardware repairs go, the Joy-Con is relatively easy to repair on your own. But the thing that people need to understand is that not every Switch user is like us who are actively part of gaming communities, watch five hour video essays about Japanese dating sims, and for the most part, have a better idea of how components and electronics work in this controller, or have the means to figure it out on your own. Is it an easy repair? For some people, yes, but I don't expect an eight year old to figure out how to repair their drift, nor do I expect their electronic illiterate parents to either. When I see these kind of arguments, I get the sense that they're from people who are assuming all Switch owners are like them, enthusiasts. And I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, I'm an enthusiast. I spend hours and hours every single week making videos about this stuff. I'm a giant nerd, but I also don't expect every single Switch owner to make their own repairs. For some people, any electronic repair, no matter how quote unquote simple it may be, will be a daunting task and they would rather not risk botching their $80 controller because some Redditor with a lot of karma claims it's the best solution. And honestly, even if you have the means and ability to repair your Joy-Cons yourself, you don't suddenly lose the right to complain about this stuff. Just because the repair is a solution that works, doesn't mean that the problem isn't worth making some noise about in order to get these companies to actually make some hardware changes. I've also seen a lot of people claim really simple fixes like using rubbing alcohol or some other cleaner will 
instantly resolve all drifting issues. Despite the fact that, you know, like a ton of people, myself included, have tried those fixes and had no luck. I'm not saying it won't work for some, but there doesn't seem to be a one-size-fits-all solution for joystick drift that can be easily implemented by the standard user. And believe it or not, Nintendo owners are actually getting the better end of the deal. In the DualSense's case, the potentiometers are soldered directly into the controller's motherboard, making the repair process significantly more complicated. And if someone leaves a comment about how everyone can just casually pick up soldering, I'm going to find you and have a serious talk with your parents. I call this the five stages of joystick drift denial. Joystick drift doesn't exist. Joystick drift exists, but it's not any more widespread than it was in the past. Joystick drift exists, is more widespread, but that's just because people don't know how to take care of their controllers. Joystick drift exists, is more widespread, is happening regardless of condition, but Company X is offering free repairs. Joystick drift exists, just fix it yourself, bitch. And I know, I know that despite everything I just said, there will still be people in the comments arguing that joystick drift isn't a real problem. All I have to say is this. One, just because something isn't happening to you personally doesn't mean that it's not happening at all. And two, you don't need to defend multi-billion dollar corporations. They're doing okay. I understand what these companies and the games they make mean to you. I hold a lot of those feelings too. But you can criticize something you like. Someone criticizing Nintendo over Joy-Con Drift does not mean they're criticizing you because you like Nintendo games. Trust me, take it from someone who did this for far too long. Attaching your identity completely to the media you consume won't lead you to a good place. But Honestly, the joystick drift deniers are far from the thing that annoy me the most about this whole problem. The actual joystick drift isn't even the thing about the joystick drift problem that bothers me the most. I don't think it's a coincidence that each one of the big three are having drifting problems, and it's not because they all use the same potentiometer manufacturer. In the time since my original Joy-Con drift video, sites like IGN and iFixit have put out pretty solid breakdowns explaining exactly why, from a mechanical perspective, the drifting issues are happening. But what I feel like these pieces lack is a more holistic perspective, identifying the core source of these problems beyond hardware degradation. Why a company like Nintendo, who once recalled every single Famicom over a defective motherboard and a small percentage of consoles, can be so dismissive about a widespread defect? In only a few short decades, gaming has gone from a niche hobby to the fastest growing entertainment industry on the planet. That growth has led to the creation of some incredibly deep and groundbreaking technical marvels that simply wouldn't be possible if gaming wasn't so profitable. Profitable, but it also comes with a dark side. The bloat of the industry means less connection between company and consumer. Shareholders who don't care or even like video games, executives who force developers and publishers to have consistent releases regardless of quality, and people who just want to make a lot of fucking money at the expense of their employees and their customers. The same way we get unfinished AAA games, have game designers crumbling under oppressive work environments, and have CEOs getting paid hundreds of millions of dollars amidst massive layoffs, we get companies cutting costs in whatever way possible in the pursuit of the almighty dollar. And yeah, I know gaming is definitely not the only industry that suffers from these issues. It's weird, it's almost like the system incentivizes large corporations to do whatever they want to make money regardless of the consequences. When components get more expensive, have to fit in smaller form factors, and are expected to contain cutting edge technology, most businesses would much rather compromise on quality rather than risk the horrible, scary world of, if there are any corporate executives listening, go ahead and cover your ears for the next couple of seconds. I don't, I don't want to scare you. Slimmer profit margins. It may seem a bit reductive, but that's really what this comes down to. Alps is very upfront about the life cycle that these potentiometers have, which by the way is definitely not long enough, but Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft all continue to use them likely because it's good for their bottom line. But what we're seeing now is just the uncomfortable truth that these companies have to face. This design is not sustainable. They either gotta use better potentiometers, drop them all together, or make controllers more modular and joysticks easier to replace. 
But we know what they'll say. But that means spending a lot of money on research and development. It means controllers will cost more because we need to make a profit so our shareholders are happy. And we could never design our products so the consumer can do whatever they want with their own property. What if you hurt yourself? And besides, wouldn't you just rather buy a new one?